Welcome back to the Fast Neutron. In today's video, we're going to introduce the concept of cross sections, which will help us understand how we quantify the ways in which particles interact with matter. Our last video discussed neutron scattering, and we talked through some of the formulas which govern how neutrons transfer energy when they collide with nuclei. Besides scattering, there are quite a few other interactions that neutrons and other particles can undergo, so a natural next step is to think through radiation interactions with matter at a higher level. We'll start off by introducing cross-sections at a conceptual level, and then use them to build a framework for modeling radiation attenuation. From there, we'll introduce quantities like flux and fluence, and we'll wrap things up with some cool plots of cross-sections varying with particle energy, which will be crucial to understand before we get into reactor theory. All of the calculations that we did in the last video assumed up front that a scattering event had taken place, but we know for a fact that neutrons and other forms of radiation can penetrate all kinds of materials so particles aren't guaranteed to interact with nuclei in their vicinity. Let's begin our discussion by thinking through how we can characterize the likelihood with which an interaction will occur. The quantity which describes this is called a cross-section. Here's a little thought experiment to get things started. Imagine we have a beam of neutrons firing from left to right. Unencumbered, these neutrons will fly off to infinity. Now, let's put an obstacle in their way. In this case, it's a sheet of material only one atom thick and these atoms are guaranteed to absorb any neutrons that collide with them. How can we go about determining the probability that a neutron from our beam is absorbed by the sheet? An intuitive way to go about this would be to take a look at the sheet head-on. Notice that the nuclei of the atoms take up a good chunk of the sheet's area, but there's still some gaps left over. If we imagine our neutron beam is firing neutrons at the sheet with random positions, it stands to reason that the probability of a neutron being absorbed is equal to the fraction of the sheet's area taken up by the nuclei. So let's come up with a formula for this. We'll represent the area of the sheet with A and the area of a single nuclei with little sigma. The probability of our neutron being absorbed is therefore just the number of nuclei times little sigma divided by the area of the sheet. To formalize how we can calculate the number of nuclei in the sheet, we can write it as the density of atoms in the sheet. And we'll write this as big N with units of atoms per volume times the sheet's volume which will be A times the thickness of the sheet delta X. And then canceling out A shows us that the probability of absorption is equal to the atom density of the sheet material times the area of an individual atom in the sheet times the thickness of the sheet. And this makes sense, as we would expect the probability of absorption to go up if the sheet was made of a more dense material, if the atoms were larger, or if the sheet itself was thicker. Little sigma, the area of an individual atom, is what's called the microscopic cross-section of our sheet's material. Cross-section here really is an intuitive name, since we define this quantity as the cross-sectional area of an atom when we look at it head-on. Now because we're talking about individual atoms here, conventional units like a square centimeter would be pretty clunky, so instead we typically use units of barns, where one barn is equal to 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. This tiny unit of area is a lot more convenient to use for an individual atom. And the name barn actually comes from the Manhattan Project, where physicists opined that uranium was as big as a barn from the perspective of neutrons. Now I should really point out that the microscopic cross-section is a bit of an abstraction. It's less the true area of a particle or atom, and more of an effective area. Most atomic nuclei have radii of around 10 to the minus 15 meters, so we would expect for most cross-sections to be on the order of a barn or less. However, when we measure cross-sections, we often see values much larger or smaller than one barn. Since we're down at the atomic or subatomic scale, we're working with objects best described by quantum mechanics. These aren't hard-bodied entities colliding like billiard balls. They have wave-like properties and there are energy levels to contend with, so things are a little bit more complicated. The microscopic cross-section is instead just the area which produces behavior that matches what we would expect to see if our projectiles were point-like particles flying at a sheet of material like in the previous example. When we multiply the material's atom density by its microscopic cross-section, we get a quantity called the macroscopic cross-section, which we represent with big sigma. This has units of inverse length, and it's equal to the probability of interaction per unit length of material. If you take the macroscopic cross-section of a slab and multiply it by the slab's thickness, you get the probability of an interaction taking place in the slab for a given particle. That's just our formula from earlier. While the microscopic cross-section is a property associated with the material itself, the macroscopic cross-section is also dependent on the material's density. 
And if you divide one by the macroscopic cross-section, you get the average distance a particle will need to travel in a material before we would expect an interaction to occur. This is called the mean free path. Before we move on, I want to quickly mention that the values of microscopic cross-sections depend on a whole host of factors. It probably comes as pretty obvious that we'll have different microscopic cross-section values for different materials. I mean, it can be made up of all sorts of different isotopes, after all. But cross-section magnitudes also depend on the type of incident particle. Some materials really like to interact with neutrons, but are fairly transparent to photons, and vice versa, so that plays into things. And then the energy of the incident particle is also massively important in determining the likelihood of interaction, as is the temperature of the material, the type of interaction we're interested in, whether the material exists as a free gas or if it's bound in a lattice, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot that goes into driving the value of little sigma. We'll talk about this in more detail in just a bit, but I just wanted to mention that up front. Now that we have the concept of cross-sections in our tool belt to talk about the probability of interactions, we can get on with deriving a more general framework for radiation attenuation that will allow us to think about phenomena more complicated than a monodirectional beam of neutrons on a one atom thick sheet. For instance, if we can quantify how a stream of neutrons is absorbed by a slab of material as a function of the slab's thickness, that would allow us to start thinking through engineering problems like designing radiation shields. Let's start our discussion of radiation attenuation by thinking about how the intensity of a beam will change as it passes through a slab of material. Here, intensity is a quantity which describes the strength of our beam as a function of the position we find ourselves in within a slab. Whenever an interaction occurs in our slab, we would expect the intensity of the beam to decrease, and we can write a differential equation to describe this as follows. The change in intensity over a differential slice of our slab, di dx, will be equal to negative big sigma times the beam intensity at that point. Remember that sigma is the probability per length of an interaction occurring. So if we integrate this expression from zero to x, we'll get an expression for the intensity of the beam, which has not undergone any interactions up to x. This comes out to i of x equals i of zero times e to the negative sigma x, where i of zero is the initial intensity of the beam at the surface of the slab. So while the probability that we have an interaction here is constant from point to point, the amount of beam which penetrates the slab up to some point x falls off exponentially. If our slab's material changes with position so that sigma is actually also dependent on x, we can generalize our formula as follows. Here's an example of how this would play out for a 2 cm thick slab with a macroscopic cross-section of 1 inverse centimeter. The intensity of the beam prior to the slab is constant, since it isn't interacting with anything. Then once it hits the slab, we see the intensity fall exponentially. Once the beam exits the slab, the intensity once again remains constant. For something a little more complicated, let's take a look at a two-part slab, where the first section from x equals 1 to x equals 2 has a macroscopic cross-section of 0.3 inverse centimeters, and the second section from x equals 2 to x equals 3 has a macroscopic cross-section of 1 inverse centimeters. In the first section, the beam attenuates away slowly, since the probability of interaction per length is lower. And then once we hit the second section, we attenuate away more quickly. I'm sure you can see now how this concept would be useful if we were trying to design a radiation shield. Depending on how much we wanted to attenuate a beam away, and how thick we wanted our shield to be, we could pick materials with suitable macroscopic cross-sections to accomplish our goal. Before we move on to looking at how neutron cross-sections vary with energy, I have a quick aside I want to make. There's actually more than one way in which radiation can be attenuated. What we're showing here is called material attenuation, which is the reduction in radiation intensity when radiation interacts with an obstacle in its path. A second type of attenuation is geometric attenuation. Instead of a monodirectional beam, imagine we had an isotropic point source of radiation. Isotropic here just means that it's emitting particles in all directions with equal probability. You can imagine that as we move further away from the point source, the paths that the particles trace out will become more and more spread out in space. Now the intensity quantity we were using earlier is a little simplistic for this example, so let's introduce a new quantity called flux. Flux is just a measure of how many particles are passing through a location every second on a per area basis, and we represent it with the Greek letter phi. More accurately, flux is the path length density with units of per area per time. 
At a distance r away from the source, the flux will therefore be the rate at which particles are being emitted, q, divided by the area of a sphere with radius r. This area grows as r increases, so flux drops off proportional to 1 over 4 pi r squared. This reduction in flux as particle paths spread out in space is called geometric attenuation. If our point source was placed inside a sphere of material, all we would need to do to update our phi formula is to add in the term from earlier which describes the material attenuation that would occur, e to the negative sigma r. By the way, if you integrate flux over some duration, you'll get the total number of particles passing by per area over that time period. This quantity is called fluence, and then if you integrate fluence over some surface, you'll get the total number of particles which hit that area during that time period. The radiation exposure sustained by a target is a function of this quantity, and this is why in radiation safety, we consider the time someone spends by a source, the distance they are from that source, and the shielding between them and the source. If you want to limit your exposure to radiation, you can spend less time near a source, get further away from it, or put some shielding between you and the source. All right, now that we have an understanding of cross-sections and how they apply to radiation attenuation, let's close things out by taking a look at some actual cross-section values. We'll start by looking at a neutron cross-section for hydrogen-1, the simplest of isotopes. Earlier, I mentioned that the value of a cross-section varies depending on the specific interaction we're talking about, so let's look at the cross-section for scattering off of this plot doesn't really tell us all that much. It's clear that at low energies, the cross-section is pretty high, but even for just a single EV, it seems like the cross-section is basically zero. So let's transform the x-axis to a logarithmic scale. I'm going to highlight a region in the plot which shows the cross-sections when energies get down to fractions of an EV. Neutrons with these energies are called thermal neutrons, since they have such low energies that they're in thermal equilibrium with the material around. Notice that the curve for the cross-section looks like the left half of a parabola. In this region of the plot, the cross-section is proportional to 1 over the square root of energy, or 1 over the velocity of the neutron. This behavior is common in many cross-section profiles. Now let's transform the y-axis to be logarithmic as well. Our 1 over v relationship now looks like a straight line, and we can see a little more complicated behavior. The likelihood of a scattering event happening levels off until high energies in excess of 10,000 EV, at which point it starts to tail off again. Now let's look at something a little more interesting. Let's plot the fission cross-section of the most common isotope of uranium, uranium-238. Right off the bat, things are looking a little more complicated here. At thermal energies, we can still see the 1 over V region that we saw with hydrogen, but then once we get to these intermediate energies, which are sometimes called epithermal energies, things kind of go crazy. We have these steep peaks and valleys where specific energies of neutrons are tens of thousands of times more likely to cause fission than neutrons with just slightly different energies. These peaks here are called resonances, and the reason that they're there is rooted in quantum physics. It's pretty well known that electrons exist in discrete energy levels, and the same is true for nuclei. In fact, there's a whole model, the nuclear shell model, which predicts these energy levels. Interactions are most likely to occur when an incoming neutron has just enough energy to cause the product nucleus to hop up to one of those energy levels. When this is the case, we see a huge spike in the cross-section. As we go even higher in terms of energy, we get fast neutrons, which are indeed the namesake of this channel. When neutrons are emitted from splitting atoms, they're up at these energies. Finally, let's look at another isotope of uranium in order to see how cross-sections can vary for a single element based upon the number of neutrons it has. This is the cross-section for uranium-235. As we can see for thermal and epithermal energies, U-235 is thousands to millions of times more likely to undergo fission compared to U-238, which makes it really good fuel for reactors. If you dig uranium up out of the ground, only about 0.7% of it will be U-235 while the remainder will be almost entirely U-238. In order to improve the quality of the uranium that we put into reactors, uranium is typically enriched, a process where the fraction of U-235 is increased. We can also see that for uranium-235, slow neutrons are way better at causing fission than fast neutrons. For this reason, many reactors intentionally slow down neutrons to thermal energies so that they're more likely to split an atom. U-238 is actually more likely to be split by a fast neutron. That's a story for another day. We'll talk more about all of this in a later video, 
but if you hear about thermal spectrum reactors versus fast reactors, it's referring to the type of neutrons relied upon in those reactors to perform the bulk of atom splitting. Depending on the energy of neutrons in a reactor, fission and capture and absorption cross-sections can vary significantly, and this leads to some pretty profound differences in how reactors behave. Thanks for watching. Now that we understand cross-sections, we're finally ready to start introducing reactor theory in the next video. Hope to see you there.